Thank you, Mr. Fisher, for taking time out of your busy day today to answer some questions regarding cybersecurity. Can you please talk about who is buying cyber insurance and for what? Uh, who's buying cyber insurance? Well, today's world, and I'll just give you context. Anybody who's got PII, personal identification information, is, should be buying cybersecurity. If you go back five years ago, there really wasn't a market for it. If you got 20 million of policy limit, that's how much coverage you'd have if you had a breach. Today, you can probably buy 100 to 200 million. Um, but anybody who has PII stored on their computers, be it a health insurance company, an insurance company, Target, um, they should be buying it. I sat on the board of First Data Corp, the largest credit card processor in the world, processes roughly 50 some percent of every credit, debit, and gift card in the world, and we bought 250 million of limit. When we started, we could barely buy 70. So anybody in, who's, in, who's, tr who's charged with having PII in their system should be buying it. Could you now please talk about some of the losses or damages that could occur with the lack of insurance? Well, <laughs> insurance is one thing. It protects you financially, but reputationally, you have to have all the, all the protections in the world and you can never have enough because the hackers are getting better. As, what do I mean by that? At first data, our firewalls were hit over 250,000 times a day. We had redundant systems and we had to constantly see, has anybody been in? Has anybody got access to PII? Because if something happens, and I'll just give you a tangible example, somebody gets my information and they, they get my credit card information, what, what they typically do, if they get access to PII, it could be from a waiter. A waiters run these, they have card readers on their ankles. Before they run your card, they run the card through that, through that reader, and then they, you can make a credit card in 30 seconds. It's the same technology as uh, you employ in uh, getting a hotel key. So then what they do is they go to usually a big, a big box vendor like uh, Best Buy. They buy stuff that's easy to sell, tablets, flat screens, and the like, and they just keep doing it. And then they'll go to a gas station late at night and run the card. If it doesn't get rejected, they keep doing it. If it does get rejected, they apologize to the attendant, they pay in cash, they throw that card away, and then they go to the next one. So if that happens, and say I see charges, and it's happened to me a lot of times. In fact, I, I suspect one restaurant in the city of New York that somebody's doing something they shouldn't. I get all these charges in Swiss airlines and things like that, and I, I decline them. So then what happens is <clears throat> I have to sign an affidavit. The credit card company has to go then to whoever pr provided, say, that ticket, and they have to get, it's called a chargeback. They have to say, nope, it's, it, this is no good. The customer said it wasn't him, and then they go through this contest, contentious relationship as to whose fault was it. And so if they decide that the PII was compromised, and it was, say, the, person, the, the company holding that PII's fault, for every instance that it happens, I believe the fine can be up to $50,000 by the government. I think it's $50,000. But it could be a lot, of, a lot of money, but more importantly, even if you have insurance, it's the reputational risk. Just think about Target, Home Depot, people that had these breaches like recently Anthem Insurance. You know, you scare your customers. That's not a good thing. With insurance plans being so complex, how do you determine the cost? Well, <clears throat> in order to procure, procure uh, cyber insurance, the underwriters, such as Lloyd's, AIG, ACE, it's typically the very large insurance carriers that will, will do this, not some small regional insurance carrier. They bring their experts in and they test your systems. What, what firewalls do you have? What detection systems do you have? What redundancy do you have? And based upon their grade of how good they think you are, that's what they'll determine whether it, they'll say yes or no, and then they'll determine how much limit, how much liability limit they're willing to, pro to offer you. So it's a complicated underwriting process. And over the last, I'd say, 10 years, it's gotten much more sophisticated. In your opinion, would local governments benefit more from having a cybersecurity insurance package rather than self-insuring themselves? Uh, local governments have a lot of information on you. 
They have all your personal information. They have your social security. They know where you live. Uh, they know your phone number. Uh, Self-insuring for a, a, a municipality is okay because generally speaking, for them to get in trouble, there's a different liability threshold because generally speaking, they have indemnity. So simply put, I once, my son played football here, and once I was going to his high school football game, and I, I fell through a faulty drainage storage um, drain, and I cut my leg really badly, and I almost had to have my, from tear down, removed. And I would wanted to sue the township where this game was played. And I got told, sorry, they have immune, they have, they're, they're immune, you can't sue them. So that's why they're probably comfortable self-insuring it, but still somebody's gonna end up paying the losses. So if they self-insure it, what's that gonna mean? If they have to pay those losses, if it gets adjudicated, and even though they have this immunity that they have to pay, ultimately it's gonna be charged to every taxpayer in that town, because they're just gonna pass it on. What firms are now entering this growing business? All the major insurance companies throughout the world are, are in it um, and to varying degrees. Five years ago, they weren't doing it. They brought in a team, technology-driven underwriters. So they had the expertise to assess the under, you know, how good is this company at protecting PII to determine whether they're willing to sell them insurance. And if you think about the liability um, that you're buying, if for a dollar of liability, you're maybe paying three to five cents for that dollar of liability. So if you're buying $100 million of coverage, you're only paying three to $5 million for that protection. So you, it's really to determine that there's not gonna be a loss when you underwrite it. You try to underwrite it to what's called a zero loss tolerance that you only take the good risks. You don't want the person who can't answer any of your questions about how do you protect PII. And what is your future expectation for cybersecurity? And do you think individuals will be purchasing cyber insurance? Well, actually, personal insurance is being offered now. And uh, there's usually a sublimit in your homeowner's policy that protects you from liability. And it's not universal, but some are doing it. Um, when you think about the sophistication of the hackers, this is going to go on forever because I'll give you a tangible example. Do you remember when the Google Wallet was, was launched and that was near field communication where you had to tap the, the Google phone on a, on a new card reader, you had to buy a new point of, point of sale card reader to run a card? Well, when Google came out with that, a hacker in China said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this within a week. He was wrong, he did it in two days. And when you think about what's the origin, and I should have addressed this earlier, of these attacks, it's generally speaking state-sponsored terrorism. A lot of it, there's 300 spy schools in China alone. A lot of it's former Soviet bloc. And, and then you have just your kids sitting in a dorm room who decides, hey, I'm gonna be disruptive, and you know they're very good with computer technology. And that, that is, it's escalating, it's not de-escalating. And right now it's gotten very sophisticated to the point where if somebody gets into your system, they may lay dormant and dormant for weeks and months trying to figure out how your, how your um, servers are configured to try to then get access to the PII. And in a lot of places it's encrypted, so no one server, for example, just to take it simplistically, would have my Amex number. So when, I, when they run my Amex card, goes up into the cloud, the, the server configurations say, oh yeah, with this, nut, with this name, and then boom, merges in nanoseconds, the card number, you know, the security code, and that's how it happens. So what's increasingly occurred is they get in, they figure it out, they then, when they leave, after they get what they want, they retrace their steps. So you, sometimes it's very it's difficult to determine if they were in, and even if you find out they were in, did they get access to PII? When you think of all the data security companies that have, have cropped up over the last 20 years, all the big four accounting firms have practices in this. So when you suspect something's happened, you bring them in lickety-split. And I was the chairman of the audit committee of 
first data. I've sat with the FBI. I've sat with the NSA. This is a big thing. Yeah, for the last question, could you just talk a little bit more about what PII is? Oh, it's personal identification information. It's your date of birth, your social security. If they've got PII and it's your credit card, it's your credit card number, date of expiry, and the security code that's on the back. And those are stored in what's called bin files. Don't ask me what a bin file is because I don't remember. Um, I'm, I'm working proof that knowledge is not cumulative, but it's stored in bin files, and if they get access to bin files, that's when they can replicate thousands of cards because, as I said earlier, it only takes 30 seconds. So once somebody has all my identification information, even if they just got my social and date of birth, they can start using other databases to try to access my bank account. If you think about today's world, how this has all changed, I, if I want to wire transfer money, say to my kids just between accounts or to one of my businesses, not only do I have to sign a wire transfer, I have to call the bank. Because even ACH, automatic clearinghouse transactions, are now being suspect because this, the crooks are actually doing that. Um, give you another example, which is mind boggling to me. My tax return's about this big because I have all these partnerships that I'm a member in. Somebody got my PII, we don't know how, at least my social and my name, and they filed a false tax return on my part, and they had a tax refund on it. Fortunately, the IRS fraud detection systems kicked in and said, no, 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 this isn't, you know, he doesn't file a normal 1040 EZ, but that's how, I mean, if these people that are obviously quite bright would ever turn themselves to doing good as opposed to bad, but it's now affecting the IRS, not just the card companies. Now it's affecting the health insurers. It's not getting any easier.